Hello fellow Husker fans, this is Ethan Weiss. Welcome to another edition of 4 Hours to Lincoln. And I got a depressing one for you today as yesterday everything just seemed like a failure. Uh, of course the uh, track and field team is competing at the Graduate Classic. Uh, everything we're competing in in that, we're doing great as we should be as we're facing off against multiple junior colleges and whatnot. But wrestling, basketball, gymnastics, all just bit the dust yesterday. So I'll go over that a little bit and talk about the uh, tennis team that competes today. So uh, not a fun episode today, guys. Uh, Let's get right down to it. I'll talk to, talk about the Graduate Classic, how we're competing in that. We uh, <clears throat> completed day one of the Graduate Classic, uh, starting with the women's weight throw. Cami Gar Garbian uh, took first place in the women's weight throw, throwing 19.82 meters. Uh, Hella V. Carlson took second place. Ariel Emmentorp took third. Amelia Flint took six. Sage Burbach took 11th in that event. Uh, women's pole vault, Jessica Gardner took first place in that, throwing exactly four meters. you got Kylie Clark, who took fifth. Hannah Pressler took sixth in that event. Uh, in the women's long jump, Rebecca Pecora took uh, first place in uh, uh, jumping for 5.88 meters. Ashley McElmurray in second, going for 5.77. So a little, nice little difference there. Uh, Barbore D. Baum uh, took seventh place. Rihanna Phipps took ninth. Men's long jump uh, did not keep uh, compete very well in that. Colby Heinerickson is the only one placed in seventh. Men's weight throw, Henry Zimmerman took first. Throwing to for 22.42 meters. Max Herman took uh, third. Kay Moran took fourth. Sek Schnackenberg took fifth. Brett Schwartz took sixth. Josh Marcy fouled out. Uh, then in the men's pole vault, uh, Till Steinfort, uh, one of the bigger stars in track and field, took first. Uh, throwing for 5.05 meters. Colby Hein Erickson took fourth. Nick Loibel took fifth. Nobody took, competed in the men or women's 1,000 meters. And that was day one of action. So day two starts today. Uh, in fact, uh, before this video uploads, uh, they'll be competing. So with that in mind, let's talk about uh, the first thing, which was our wrestling duel. And we, and we, ladies and gentlemen, we laid an egg. We did not compete very well. Yeah, I know my uh, prediction was very far fetched, but I, I very well thought we could have come out of this with a victory. So let's uh, get right down to that. As I wish I could uh, just find the source here. Um, starting at 125, uh, Caleb Smith taking on, uh, oh, who did he take on? Okay, guys, sorry. Caleb Smith took on Drake Ayala. Smith battled and scored three escapes, but Ayala scored two takedowns en route to that 7-3 decision at 133 pounds. This was the win of the day, the win of Friday. Uh, Jacob Van D, ranked number 30th in the country, uh, took down, uh, beat Brody Tusky uh, to even the team score to 3-3. Three to three. Uh, Van D took, uh, struck first with a takedown, um, th uh, leading 3-1 to one and entering the second period. He grabbed an escape and takedown in the second period. Teske tallied three escapes in the second and third periods, but Van Deed secured another takedown in the final period to secure the 10-4 decision. Uh, at 141 pounds, Brock Hardy ranked number seventh in the country. This one I thought we could have stole. 
Um, no, excuse me. This is not the one I thought we could, because uh, he took on Real Woods. Real Woods, good, great wrestler. Um, but uh, he fell eight to, in an 8-2 to two decision. Woods scored seven straight points, take the lead from the whistle. Hardy earned a point from Woods, stalling and an escape point in the third period, but it wasn't enough to overcome. Then you got Ridge Lovett taking on Caleb Ratchin. I thought this was going to be a pin for sure, but it did not wind up that way. He, but instead, he takes a 6-0 decision, which is still great. Um, but uh, he used an escape, a stalling point against Ratchin, and a takedown to Cruz to the team's second win of the night, try, tying the score 6-6. So we're still in this duel at this point. In a top three matchup, Peyton Robb dropped the 157-pound match to number two, Jared Frannick. Robb held the 4-3 advantage midway through the final period when Frannick managed to take the uh, down to take the bout in a 5-4 decision. That was very disappointing to see. Robb drops his second straight match. No, I get it. Number two, but... You know, you had a nice crowd uh, behind you. These people traveled in ice just to come see you guys. And, you know, we give them this absolutely terrible performance. Um, at 165, now, you know, I get it. I, I'm, you know, I'm still glad Peyton Ross with us to this day because, you know, um, you all know over the course of the NCAAs, he fought a very frightening battle with a skin infection that almost took his life, almost took a limb. So I'm glad Peyton Rom's here with us. Um, you know, he said it himself, you know, that he he uh, appreciates wrestling more and whatnot. So, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing that fight in him right now. Um, so it, and I believe this match kind of set the course for everything else to come uh, in this whole duel. So at 165, Antrell Taylor scored a pair of escapes but fell to Michael Caliendo, who's ranked number seventh in the country. Uh, sting, stringing together two takedowns and escape in the writing time point. Caliendo's help, uh, helped extend Iowa's lead 12 to 6 at this point. Then uh, 174 pounds, Bubba Wilson took the early lead over Patrick Kennedy with a takedown, but Kennedy answered with a takedown and escape. Wilson used an escape to tie it up at four apiece, entering the third period with a takedown and escape. Kennedy took the 9-4 decision. Uh, then at 184 pounds, he got number three, Lenny Pinto. Uh, grabbing bonus points with a 17-5 major decision over Aiden Riggins. The wrestlers remained scoreless in the first period, but Pinto jumped out to a 6-2 lead in the second period with a pair of takedowns. In the third period, Pinto erupted for three takedowns, only answered by three escapes from Riggins. Uh, then one of my, the most disappointing matches of the night right here. You had number 11, Silas Allred, at 197 pounds, our Big Ten champion from last year, uh, took on Patrick Kennedy. Uh, Iowa was leading 15-1 overall. Zach Glaze, er, yeah, no, okay, I'm sorry, guys. He took on Zach Glazier. I don't know why this was telling me Patrick Kennedy. Uh, but he took on Glazier, uh, scored a takedown in the first two periods and an escape in the third to secure the 11-2 major decision and overall team victory. And so that kind of took the will out of uh, our heavyweight matchup that involved Nash Hutmacher, uh, you know, because it could have dwindled down to him to win the duel and, it, you know, the place would have went electric, but instead the crowd was silent. You can hear a pin drop, and it just was not a lot of fun. So at 285, uh, Nash Hutmacher's uh, second match of his collegiate wrestling career. Um, you can tell he's got a long ways to go and 
if he wants to compete seriously in collegiate wrestling, the D one collegiate wrestling, you know, he's got a hill to climb there because, um, you know, he. I mean, I'm not. I'm gonna say he's not doing too bad for his first time on the mat after two years in D one collegiate wrestling. But you can, def if you know wrestling at all, you can definitely tell there's a lot of rustiness. There's still a lot to learn because it, it's just a whole different animal at this level. Um, but rounding out the evening, uh, he battled Bradley Hill at heavyweight. <clears throat> uh, Hoodmacher did score uh, first with an escape, but, but that was after a first period where nothing was happening. Uh, but he chose bottom in the second period, got an escape, which was nice, and it was big. Uh, it, it was a hard bot escape, that's for sure. Uh, but not enough after Hill grabbed a 4-1 decision, uh, and the Hawkeyes beat us in a dual score, 22-10. to It was just not a lot of fun at the Bob last night. Uh, so up next, we hit the road to take on Minnesota on uh, January 19th. Um, so that's a doable uh, duel. That's a winnable one. Uh, I was just oh, found a way over Power West in every way. Um, and they're a great wrestling team. And that's kind of where I want to make my point. We need to stop this mental thing where I was better than them because they're not all right we were so and all and I'm talking about in all the sports okay wrestling Iowa is a different animal and they are always in the run for a natty every year all just like our volleyball team they're always in the consideration rightfully so I, I mean they're a great historic wrestling program Nebraska has great history in wrestling, but not near to the level of Iowa does. But, you know, we, there was, I mean, there was a reason to be optimistic about this duel and a belief to win this thing. And I think we very well could have, but we, I think there's just this mental illness and I'm not just saying us I it's every team that faces Iowa they have this uh, mental downfall when they have to go up against Iowa in anything and I really do think that's gotta stop like you know like I said great wrestling team but there are times where I think the better team is their opposition but they have this mental Dang, you know, it, but uh, what's stopping teams from beating Oklahoma State? What's, uh, you know, um, but it, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know the, how the words to put describe it, but it's just, you know, absolutely asinine. And I'm also talking about the men's basketball team, which I'll get to here in a little bit. It just... I, I don't know what this thing going up against Iowa is, what, how it's mentally screwy with us, you know. I, I don't know. I really don't know. But, um, like I said, we go up against Minnesota on the 19th, uh, another top 10 dual matchup in that regard, so... I don't know. Very disappointing night at the Bob. Uh, and I'll get to the basketball game here in a minute, but let, let's talk about the gymnastics squad as they um, took third overall in this uh, event that they performed not bad, but uh, just not enough to snag a couple more wins in. Um, but they did see six career highs in this thing as well, though, at the squad meet. So, um, yeah, of course, we, you know, we're the second to last team. But we also seen some improvement from 
this gymnastics squad, and of course they're they're great teams they competed against. So let's uh, talk about this real quick. Um, they enjoyed six career highs at the Sprouts Farmers Market Collegiate Quad. Uh, Singe back say grabbed two personal bests at 9.900 on four and 9.825 on vault. While Martina Komen seized a career high on four with 9.925. And Kenzie Davis earned a 9.975 on bars to tie her personal best. Then you have Isabel Sikon. Uh, she recorded a career best on beam with a 9.800. Whitney Jenks also scored a career high 9.800 on bars. Nebraska also saw two event titles, Sophia McClelland on beam with a 9.900 and Davis on bars with her 9.975. The Huskers placed third out of four teams with an overall score of 195.875. Emma Spence represented the team in the all around and posted a 38.900. Uh, Arizona grabbed the team title with a 196.475. Uh, and then you, of course, have the four rotations. The, on the first one, we started off the night on Bean, tallying a score, team score of 48.500. McClellan led the Big Red with a 9.900 in the event to grab the title. Sycon posted a career best of 9.800. And she was matched by Isaiah Hall. Spence closely followed them with a 9.775. And Lucy Stanhope and Emma Simpton rounded out the lineup. Then you had Rotation 2, where we continued the night on the floor, where Komen earned a career high of 9.925 to lead the team. She was followed by Backstay's 9.900, which was also a career best McClellan. Notched a solid 9.875, and Stan Hope and Spence both recorded uh, 9.825s. Hallie Rourke rounded out the rotation for Nebraska with an 8.925. As a team, we scored 49.350. Uh, then in rotation three, uh, we had the vault, which is always one of the score lowest scoring events in gymnastics. Uh, but we scored a 49 as a team, 49 even. They were led by Komen with a 9.850, her career, or her season high. Hall, Backsay, and Davis all recorded uh, 9.825s with Backsay's being a career high. Her second of the night, Davis scored, uh, Davis's score was a season best. Stan Hope and Spence both uh, finished the rotation. Then you had the final rotation where we concluded it uh, the whole meet on bars with a team score of 49.025. Davis led the team with a 9.975 to tie her career best and grab the event title. Sinton recorded a season best 9.850. Spence and Whitney Jenks both notched 9.800s, with Jenks being a career high. Clara Colombo and Genesis Gibson rounded out the evening for the Big Red. So, up next for the uh, gym, gym, women's gymnastics team. I cannot talk this morning, guys. I apologize. The Huskers open up their home season with a meet against Illinois on Saturday, January 20th at the Bob Devaney Sports Center at 6.30. Um, so, that is how the women's gymnastics squad competed last night. So, they didn't do bad, but they didn't win either. So, it always sucks not to get a win. Uh, but then the real big disappointment of the night was men's basketball just absolutely getting hammered by Iowa's basketball team. And once again, on the road. Uh, so, this leads me to question, guy: Can anybody win on the road in Big Ten? Can anyone? Uh... We beat Purdue at our home, you know, number one ranked team in the country. But then we just go and get slacked by Iowa on the road. A, n a not very good Iowa team, to be brutally honest. We just looked silly out there. And is this uh, a sign that, like, road games are just 
impossible to win in the Big Ten? I, I don't know. This is just absolutely crazy to me, you know. <clears throat> you would think, you know, after beating Purdue, we would be on this high. But maybe we were thinking about it too much and just didn't go in and respect Iowa at all. And that's the thing. Every opponent you play, especially in the Big Ten, especially on the road, you got to respect your opponent because, you know, it, it's going to be a dogfight. And in the Big Ten, you know, it's there, there's just nothing easy about it at all. So it just a very disappointing night. Rink Mastin, Josiah Alec had 14 points apiece, with it, which they did there. I mean, those were the two players of the night. But C.J. Wilcher, K.C. Tominaga, Sam Hoybert, they, they, they did not show up. I saw a little bit out of Bryce Williams, but it, it, it appears to me that K.C. and Sam and, you know, company – rely on our home loudness, our giddy upness to perform. And you can't just rely on that for a whole season. You just can't. You gotta find your own energy on the road. And uh, we gotta find the way to do that. We gotta, you know, I'm pretty sure Fred Hoiberg's gonna address that. Uh, hopefully, you know, cause that, it was just obsolete. Absolutely just embarrassing to see us just go and get rolled over by this Iowa team. We're four, 13 and 4 now, which, yes, we're having a great season. We're doing fine. But I feel like these road games are a huge problem. And if we can't figure out how to steal some on the road, uh, we may not see a march at all, so we gotta figure that out. Um, just, just very disappointing. Uh, cold shooting night from the three-point range. Just could not make nothing, and that that's kind of we're falling into the hands of Iowa's game because we know Iowa likes to score fast. That's just what they do. We're not that way. You know, we have to set up our shots. You know, it's kind of like football, running the ball, milking the clock, you know, wearing defenses down. That's kind of what we should have done, you know. Set up careful shots, you know. Uh, and the, our... Our thing is we shouldn't be scoring fast and trying to, you know, match the same type of game Iowa does. Because Iowa doesn't have a great defense. If we could just slow the game down, we could have very well slowed this game down and played at our own pace. But instead we try to match that fast pace, make 23s and whatnot and that just don't work for us especially on the road like that um and we did that early and we were down 17 to 2 at one point in the first period uh first half and that's what beat us we started figuring things out later but it was too late for that and we just at, got hammered um but we erased an early 15-point deficit and led 50-49 to 49 after a Kase Tominaga basket with 16.50 remaining. But the Hawkeyes took control from that point. Ben Craig had 10 of his 12 points in an 18-4 to 4 spurt over the next 537 as Iowa seized the momentum back for good. So there was two points. At the beginning of the game and at the end of the game, Iowa just rolled with these massive three-pointing point shooting spurts. And we can't match that. that we're not built for that. And, um, you know, we gave great effort. It just, you know, we need to play our way when we play somebody. We shouldn't be having to match this crazy... 23s, you know, 
we we would get a steal and then we would shoot this dumb three point shot like within two seconds of possession and that just don't work. And then Iowa, of course, rebounds and makes a three themselves, and they've been doing that all night on us. And I just don't get why we were settling for that game plan. I don't get it if we would have just slowed it down. I mean, because I was defense wasn't that great, and there was time when we were playing excellent defense. You know, and if we would have just stuck with that, we would have been fine and won this game. So I'm pretty sure that's something Fred uh, will know for next time. Um, but yeah, what an absolutely embarrassing loss this was. Uh, we're, we're not going to be ranked on Monday. And that is why, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why aren't we ranked? Well, this is why we can't win a road game. And that it's got to be fixed. And we're, and on road games, we seem to try to match what the other team's doing. And I, I, I just don't see that working. We just, we got to play our way and find our own energy on the road. At home, I, I believe we can beat anybody. But on the road, there's something that needs fixed. You know, we could have beat Wisconsin at home. We can beat Iowa at home. We can beat anybody anywhere but we gotta figure out you know uh, how to channel our own energy on the road you know we can't always rely on our own home to win games you know we gotta steal some on the road if we want to have a great march you know I was laughing at somebody saying well ESPN predicts you'd be t number 12 on uh, a 12 seed in the NCAA, the nice thing. Well, we just beat Purdue. Well, okay. Well, this is probably why we will be number 12 if we even get in at all. Because, uh, yeah, the road games are a problem and it just needs addressed. Um, but, yeah, I like I said, I'm not hanging my head. I'm not trying to bash the team, but there is a problem on the road and. It just needs to get fixed up. Um, let's see. Uh, so we'll play Wednesday of next week as we travel to Rutgers. That's another tough place to play. Uh, the Rack, they call it. it. It's a very intimidating place to play, honestly. Actually, every road game in the Big Ten is a tough tough uh, road game I mean Big Ten is home to the most iconic menus you know and the rack is just another one of them you know just like the vault is the you know you got the rack you got the uh, Indiana whatever they call that it, it's the amphitheater play I don't know but every road game is iconic in the Big Ten so it, it, it's just uh, it's just really hard to steal one uh, on the road. So, I mean, Rutgers can even do it against us, you know. Or not Rutgers, but Purdue, sorry. Um, but, yeah, guys, I don't know what to say or do about that loss. Uh, we could have, you know, it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda thing, you know. Yes, we could have very easily beat Iowa, but... We didn't, so uh, hopefully we go on the road and figure it out against Rutgers uh, because, you know, I like to say there's a lot of basketball to be played, but it goes quick, and uh, we only got two months till March, so, and there's only 15 games left, so we're already a quarter of the way through. That's a, no, I'm sorry, 14 games, so we're just a little more than a quarter of the way through this conference play. So uh, there is, but there isn't a lot of game left. So we let, let's figure it out. Um, so with that, guys, uh, that was yesterday's depressing day. The, the day I was actually excited for, you know, I couldn't get wait to get off work. 
from the cold ass day we had, uh, it, it's like two degrees outside right now. I can kind of feel it in my house a little bit right now, but, uh, you know, I plan to stay inside this whole weekend until I have to go back out in it on Monday. But, um, oh man, what a, uh, what a depressing debacle we had yesterday in all of athletics. I, I want to wipe that clean and, uh, hopefully, uh, have, look forward to something better. And, you know, maybe Friday's loss at Iowa, Maybe we just had this crazy travel plan and just, I don't know. It, it could have been the weather. I have no idea, guys. Uh, it, it's a mystery to me. But basketball's a weird sport. Even KU lost. So, you know, it. I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, the only thing we do know is time will tell. And we'll know in March where everything falls. So I, I'm still hopeful for that uh, first tournament victory this year. But that loss last night just kind of dwindled my hope a little more. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if we can figure this out. So with that, guys, uh, the Graduate Classic does continue on today. Men's tennis does compete today uh, versus North Dakota and Creighton. Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, for any of you that are a tennis nut on here, I don't know any of you, but this shows for you as well. So the Nebraska's men's tennis team will open its 24, 2024 spring season with a doubleheader at the Sid and Hazel Dillon Tennis Center today uh there will be live streams and stats on huskers.com and updates will be posted on x slash twitter at husker m tennis so we'll take on north dakota at 11 before facing creighton at four uh so here's the series history against uh, north dakota and a little scout report for them the uh, Fighting Hawks ended the 2022-23 season with an overall record of 15 and 8 and a 2 and 2 Summit League conference mark. The 2023-24 season will be held or will be head coach Tom Boysen's third with North Dakota coaching both the men's and women's tennis teams. In 2022-23, uh, North Dakota reached the Summit League championships for the third year in a row. Head coach Tom Boysen and graduate student Victor Moreno Lozano have big red ties. Uh, Boysen is a former Husker assistant coach, and Lozano played for the Huskers from 2018 to 2022. Uh, in the series history, uh, Nebraska owns it four to nothing. Uh, we uh, faced and defeated the Fighting Hawks four times. Uh, so now here's. A little about Creighton uh, we're scouting in our series history uh, the Blue Jays ended the 2022-23 season with an overall mark of 13 and 7 and a 4-0 Big East Conference record Creighton has a new head coach Gerard po Gerhard Posh hired in August of 2023 Posh graduated from Nebraska and played in the number one single slot Creighton ended its 2022-23 spring campaign in the Big East semifinals after upsetting number eight Villanova. And our series history is, wow, this is crazy. 50 and two overall, favoring us. Uh, since, our, since our first matchup in 1954, Nebraska has gone 50 and two against Creighton. So uh, if we own some, something against Creighton it's tennis men's tennis so that's something to be said we got that right um in the fall Nebraska went 37 and 33 in singles play and 16 and 15 in doubles most notably from the fall junior Calvin Mueller posted a 10 and 3 record en route to the Big Ten individual championship 
doubles duo Anton Shep and Nick Weidenhorn went four and three on the season after making it to the semifinals match in, on the ITA Regionals Tournament. The pair was invited to ITA Nationals in California to close out fall play. Also finding success on the doubles court was duo Mueller and Leo Linquet, reaching a three and one record and placing second at the Milwaukee Tennis Classic. We ended the 2023 spring season with a team ITA ranking of number 52, the high, highest end of season ranking since 2011. Nebraska is also ranked number three in the ITA Central Region team ranking. So at least we're up there in the central area. Uh, from the 2022-23 season, Nebraska has uh, seven returning letter winners, including Rudy Christensen, Roni Hiturana, Lars Johan Leo Linquit, Shania Mariyama, Calvin Mueller, and Nick Weidenhorn. In the fall, Nebraska welcomed four newcomers, trans transfers Anton Shep, Nikolai Saisov, and Henry Billetkick, and freshman Colson Wells for the 2023-2024 season. Um, so there you have it for that. Um, I don't think we have anything else on tap for today besides the track and uh, tennis, but I know we got a women's basketball game tomorrow. Um, oh, and we also got rifle too. Let's talk about the rifle matchup uh, against Kentucky. Maybe. I don't think that's going to happen. And it's not. Uh, so we don't really have anything for that. But we do face off against Kentucky after a very disappointing uh, fall kickoff. Uh, just didn't look like a Husker rifle team in the fall. So, uh, And Kentucky's a, one of the top ranked teams in the country. So... We'll see how that all get, goes down. Uh, I know we still have defending national small board champion Cecilia Ossi, uh, who represents us well in rifle. But, um, yeah, I I don't really have high hopes for this one, to be honest. It, not if it goes for how the fall went. So, um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But then... Uh, Last thing for the weekend is the uh, basket, women's basketball game facing off against Minnesota. And, um, well, I ain't got any info on that either. So it uh, looks like they're still working on that. But um, I'll be back uh, maybe either later tonight or tomorrow morning to preview these two things when we finally get some info on it. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, shake off Friday. Let's enjoy the weekend inside, watch a movie, whatever. Uh, it's a cold one out there. Um, if you're all living in the Midwest, that is, uh, for those of you that live in places like Florida or California, congratulations. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, don't go outside if you don't have to. It's like in the negatives here. So it's a cold one. And I'm not looking forward to Monday when I actually have to work outside. But that's just what I have to do to pay the bills uh, until I get to do this for a living. If that ever happens, probably not. But there's always hope for things. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I hope to see you uh, either later tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, and hopefully talk about a tennis win. And hopefully, maybe tomorrow we'll get a women's basketball win and feel a little more hopeful. <laughs> so, anyways, guys, always be excellent to each other. Go Big Red.